Hello everyone, welcome to our first week, our very first lesson of Witch Biographies. Today we're just going to be doing an introduction and we're also going to go ahead and start digging into some material. We're going to be talking about Mother Shipton today. So first of all, I wanted to introduce myself. My name is Carla. You can call me Professor Carla, Carla, it doesn't matter. Um, and if you've been in my classes before, let me just go ahead and give you a heads up, then you know that I have a toddler, I've got dogs, it's very rarely quiet at my house, so if you hear some background noise, it's one of those things or something else, so just ignore the noise. Um, I try to keep myself in a, in a room that's a little bit more quiet whenever I do these, but it doesn't always work that way, so just bear with me if there is some background noise. So I am an admin here in the Mystique Academy, and I'm also a professor for six different classes. I am the HOH for the Dryad House, um, a few other things. So I stay pretty busy here. I'm sure that most of you have seen me around, um, maybe seen me in chats, or you might have been in my classes before. I am a mother. I've got a toddler, a three-year-old girl, which is kind of gives me the run around most days. I'm married and I've been practicing my own. I've had my own practice for witchcraft for a little over a year now. However, it's been part of my life for a very long time. I have um, a great grandmother who was a green witch and then a great, great aunt who was a hedge witch. So it's just something that's been in my family for a long time, something I've learned about for a long time. But I consider my own practice to have started to develop about a year or so ago where I was really developing it for myself and kind of adding in my own um, pathways of being a kitchen witch and then also a little bit of eclectic. I kind of pull things from everywhere. So I'm always going to be around. If you all have questions or you see me about, please feel free to talk to me. Um, you can always message me privately, or if you'd like to send me an email, that's going to be in the syllabus. But I'm always open to questions, always happy to help. So let's go ahead and talk about our syllabus. Um, you should have been able to access the link to get the syllabus for this semester. That should have been available for, before the semester started. So let's just go ahead and review that really quickly before we start digging into our material. This class, we're going to talk about real witches in history. And just to be clear, some of them are going to be suspected witches. Depending on when the time period is that they lived, we may not have a lot of formal documentation on whether or not they truly considered themselves to be a witch. Um, however, most of these people were at least suspected of that in one way or another. And as we are discussing them, we'll cover reasons why they were believed to be that. And they'll make more sense as we progress through. Um, what you can expect for this class is we are going to have weekly quizzes. We will also have weekly homework questions. And for your final project for this class, what I'm going to ask you to do is choose a real witch of, of your choosing. It doesn't matter who it is, as long as it's not one that we're covering in class. Um, and I'd like for you to give us a brief biography of this witch and also a photo or a drawing of them. Because depending on when they lived, you may not be able to access a photo. You might just have to find a drawing. And you don't have to do the drawing yourself. You can find one on Google. Um, you'll see examples of the images that I use in our slideshows. You can find something like that. That will be perfectly fine. Um, but yeah, I'd just like you for, to put together a little brief biography that you can present to the class. So what we'll do is near the end of the semester, during the week where we're going to have the final project, I'll have you all just start posting your paragraphs of information with a photo of the witch you've chosen. And if you are doing the same person as someone else, don't worry about it. It's perfectly fine. I just want to see that you all can put in the time and effort to research someone. And hopefully there's someone in history that's considered a witch or is a witch that you are already having an interest in that we're not covering. So on Mondays, I will be releasing quiz, um, a quiz and also any other assignments for the upcoming week. Then on Tuesdays will be when I'll post a video link to our classes, uh, just as I did for this one. Um, I like to do video classes on YouTube. The reason I do this is because a lot of people aren't able to attend the VC classes. 
So it just works out better if I can go ahead and pre-record something for you so that you're able to either, you know, re-reference it later if you'd like to or to listen to it on your own time because I know we all have busy schedules. We can't just, you know, definitely set aside an hour where we're going to be on an online class. That's not always possible. So I do it this way um, just because after trial and error with some other classes, this seems to work best for students. Um, and also, you know, it's just nice to be able to go back and reference it later if you want to. And I can easily use these for future classes. So this is just kind of the method that I've chosen. Um, then on Fridays at noon, in some, some weeks we might skip this session, but on Fridays at noon, we'll do a recap um, where I'll just kind of check in with you, see if you all have any questions about how we're doing or the subject we're discussing, anything like that. That's really going to be a time for you to connect with me and your other classmates. So we'll do that in our class chat. Like I said, sometimes we might skip that session. If it's, if it's seeming like, you know, everything's going pretty smoothly that week and nobody's, you know, asked a lot of questions or whatever, we might skip that, but I've just kind of set aside that time if we do need it. Um, and actually, let me go ahead and mention here, all of my times are in Eastern Standard. Um, so I'm not sure, you know, you'll have to kind of convert that for your time zone. But most people here work on Central Standard, but I actually live in Eastern Standard. So um, just a heads up. And I'll try to always remind everyone of that as I'm posting like upcoming lessons and due dates. Um, so let's just go over the schedule that we have for this semester. As you see, this first week, we're going to be talking about Mother Shipton. Um, for week two, we'll be talking about La Voisin. And then week three is Isabel Gowdy. Week four is Malin, Matt's daughter. Then the famous Tichaba will be our week five. I think everyone's familiar with Tichaba. Then week six is Marie Laveau. Week seven is Dion Fortune. I'm sorry, week eight is Murga Bien. And then the last week of class, um, we're not going to have any formal classes because that will be the week that you will be turning in your final project. So um, there won't be any video classes on the ninth week. As you can see from our schedule, I'm not sure if you're able to have this pulled up while we're discussing this, but what I'm going to be doing is for the quizzes, you'll be a week off. So during week two, on that Monday of week two, I'll release a quiz that's going to be over the material we covered for Mother Shipton. And I do that just so that you have plenty of time to go over the material. It gives you a whole week to watch the video, answer the homework questions, everything like that, before you kind of dive into the quiz. And basically the quiz is just going to be a test your own knowledge of what we discussed the previous week. And I, I do this for all of my classes. Typically students like that because they can really see where they stand so far as what they were able to retain from the lesson. Um, and just like with every other basic level course in this academy, all of this is absolutely optional. You do not have to do these things. Um, if you were to be in an upper level class, that would be different. But for these basic level classes, it's on your own pace, you know, no obligation whatsoever. It's, we are really just presenting this for you and you just do it in whatever time works for you. Okay, so as I mentioned before, these are gonna. This class is gonna be about real or suspected witches, and we're gonna talk about their lives, their practices. We might be discussing their perceived practices because, as I said before, sometimes we don't have documented evidence of what happened, and you'll see that with Mother Shipton that we're about to get into. Um, and we're also gonna talk about, in some cases, their death, um, and some of these are gonna be you know, a little bit hard to listen to, as I'm sure that you all are already aware, witches have not typically been treated with very much respect. Um, so this is, sometimes it might be a little bit triggering. So as we're approaching um, death scenarios or explanations, I'll give a little bit of a warning, a heads up that that's what's going to, that's what we're going to be talking about next. I also will not detail what happens for a death scenario in the slides. Um, I'll just kind of give a like a little bullet point that I'll say death and I will verbally discuss it, but I won't write that out. That way, if anyone is, you know, going through the lesson and they don't want to hear what's being said, you can just mute and wait until I move to the next slide. Okay. Because um, obviously we don't want anyone to be 
triggered by anything that has been said in class. So we're going to just try to avoid that the best that we can. But we're also going to talk about some misconceptions. Now, not every um, witch that we discuss will have misconceptions, but some of them do. And some of them might have rumors, things like that. We will see a few of those in this lesson. Um, but it tends to be fairly typical that there are a lot of misconceptions, as I'm sure you're aware, not only in our current world, but in the past as well, about witches and their practice. So if that comes up, we might discuss some of those. Okay, so let's go ahead and get into Mother Shipton. Um, she was born in 1488 in North Yorkshire. And that is probably the only time I'm going to say that because for some reason my lips do not want to form that word. Um, anyways, her mother was Agatha Soothtail. And I may be mispronouncing these last names, but it's the story that's, that's relevant. So Agatha was actually exiled from her community because she found out that she was pregnant at the young age of 15. Everyone in the village was really trying to get her to tell them who the father was so that he could be held responsible. They wanted her to, to see her married. They wanted to see her taken care of. But for whatever reason, she refused to say who the father was. Um, there's a lot of possibilities there. Obviously, it, he could be someone of high social standing. Maybe it was someone that was really close to her that might kind of incriminate them. There's, there's a lot of different reasons for that. Um, there are a lot of rumors around that, and we'll come up on that here soon. So Agatha actually, in the middle of the night, rode herself down the river where she found a cave in the forest of Narsboro. And she took shelter in this cave because there was like a really terrible storm going on right then. And she actually ended up loving it. So she decided to just stay there. And she gave birth and raised um, her child there. And Mother Shipton's original name was actually Ursula Sontheel. So she raised Ursula there in that cave. They were very poor. They didn't have anyone to help them. And it was really difficult, but Agatha did the best that she could. Um, and actually, there was a local magistrate who tried several times to get Agatha to come back into the community and go ahead and admit who the father was so that she wouldn't be living that way. But she absolutely refused because um, she'd been exiled. So they were not welcoming her and they wanted her. You know, we want you to come back into the community and tell us who this is so we can help you like we want to get you out of that cave and she just would not make that sacrifice granted I personally personally feel like if you care so much about her then why does it matter but you know different time so anyways there was a lot of rumors going around of course since Agatha would not re reveal the father that she had actually made a deal with the devil that she was a witch and Ursula herself was the spawn of Satan and because of that People claimed, and there's no written records of this, so we aren't sure that this is the case, but it was claimed that she was very deformed, Ursula was very deformed, that she had a hunchback and even bulging eyes. They blamed, they, they blamed that deformity on the fact that she was the spawn of Satan in their rumors. So they ended up living in this cave for about two years, which... At 15, trying to raise a two-year-old, that's that's a long time to be living in a cave with no help. Um, but so, it was 1490, and the abbot of Beverly came and removed them, the two of them, from the cave. However, they the nuns refused to let the two stay together. They sent Agatha to stay at the convent of the Order of St. Brigitte in Nottinghamshire, but Ursula was actually given to a foster family who's, who lived in Narsboro. And remember, they had been staying in the forest of Narsboro, so they're very close. But sadly, Agatha and Ursula never saw each other again. When they pulled them apart, they... I mean, it breaks my heart, but Agatha never saw her daughter again. That was the end of it. So after Agatha was sent away and Ursula was sent to live with her foster family immediately rumors are flying in their village you can only imagine and it's it's said that 
there was this really unsettling rumor that was going around really shortly after she was placed with her foster family. So the story is that her foster mother left Ursula. Ursula was only two years old at the time. Remember that. Home alone while she went to run errands. First of all, let's just talk about how absolutely irresponsible that is. Who does that? But once the foster mother returned home, she said the front door was wide open. So she was really nervous. So she ran to her neighbor's house and she was like, hey, you know, somebody's been in my house. The door is wide open. Can you come with me? I don't know who's inside. So her neighbors accompanied her. And when they entered the home, they said they found Ursula cackling and screeching perched on top of an iron bar that was above their fireplace. Now remember, she's only two, but this just started rumors flying even more than they ever had. And people were certain that she was just a devil child. And it was really hard for her. She was very, very heavily teased, very much made fun of, but this didn't last very long. The teasing, the the bullying, she was even teased and bullied by adults. But like I said, this didn't last long because people said that at some point in Ursula's young life as a, as a child, anyone that made fun of her dealt with very serious but unexplainable consequences. And people eventually just stopped teasing her because they were truly afraid of what would happen to them if they did. And sadly... Ursula never found true acceptance. Um, She had her foster family and a couple of friends, but the society, their community, their village, no one there really ever accepted her. And they say that it's because of all of her deformities. She had a crooked nose, crooked legs, a hunchback, and people just could not forget what had occurred with her, her birth, her mother, just all the rumors. They couldn't forget it. And it's really sad because, you know, she's a child at this point that has just been completely unaccepted. None of this is her fault. She can't help what has happened to her, how she was born. So it's, it's really sad. So she ended up seeking safety and comfort in the forest and the cave where she was born. Uh, she spent a lot of her time there. And she actually taught herself a lot about the plants, herbs, and different things about natural healing as she was living there. And as she had gotten older, she was becoming an adult. She was getting to where she was really deeply feared, but also respected. People had begun to see her as a witch, but they also admired her herbal knowledge and skills. And she was truly becoming a master of herbology. A lot of times people would come to her for spells or potions. She was starting to become really revered in their village. And then at 24 in 1512, she married a man named Toby Shipton. Now, again, poor Ursula cannot escape just the rumor mill. But given her physical appearance, people believed that she had to have bewitched Toby to get him to marry her. Which is just, that's just heartbreaking that somebody would think that, first of all. Um, but nobody believed that he truly married her because he had genuine feelings for her. They just believe he had been spelled. So they were married. They seemed fairly happy. Then one day, not too long after they had gotten married, one of her friends, a neighbor, came to Mother Shipton, as she had now taken that name, um, after being married to Toby Shipton. They came to her and told her that someone had broken into their home and stolen a smock that they had, that they had really liked, and something else. I can't remember what something else is. I apologize. But the smock is what's important. So Mother Shipton told this friend, don't worry, I know who it is, and we will go and fetch it tomorrow. So the next morning, her and the friend got up, and they went to market. You know, how they have, like, kind of like a grocery store, but it was, like, outside, you know, you got to you got to think in like 16th century terms. So when they got there, they saw the woman who had stolen the smock and she was just making a mockery of her thievery. Basically, she was running around and talking about how she'd gotten the smock and just kind of flaunting it everywhere. And once this woman saw Mother Shipton, she Mother Shipton did not have to say anything. 
this woman came up to her and they made eye contact for a few moments. And without anything being said, suddenly the woman took the smock off, handed it back and left without a word. Didn't say anything. People already had suspicions about Mother Shipton being a witch and having certain powers. So this just kind of confirmed it for the people that were around. So sadly, in 1514, Toby passed away. And again, these rumors are just flying like crazy. People are making up stories. And everyone had pretty much decided that Mother Shipton must have disposed of him I guess herself that it was her fault he was gone and that she had done something to cause his death and at this point she is just getting sick and tired of dealing with these rumors it's just getting to a point where it's affecting her life no one takes her seriously there's everyone has their own ideas about her and she's just really tired of dealing with it so she decided that she was going to just hide herself away and she went right back to the cave where she was born, where she had been kind of seeking Haven through her childhood. And she decided that that's where she was going to stay. And once she did this word about her started spreading even more rapidly through the village and even the surrounding communities and farther reaching than that. And people were traveling from all over to come and see her and to purchase spells from her, potions, everything like that. She was really making quite a name for herself, kind of unintentionally. It really just happened by word of mouth. So as she was getting to be more revered with her community, she finally revealed to them that for years she had been having visions and prophecies. And she started revealing what those were. And eerily enough, most of these visions were said to have come true. So once this was happening and people started seeing her prophecies be true and finding some validity in that, people started seeking her out for their fortunes to be told and to learn more about what was coming in their own life. So let's talk about some of her prophecies and how those ended up ultimately coming true. Okay, so the first prophecy that we're going to discuss is this one. Water shall come over Aus Bridge, and a windmill shall be set upon a tower, and an elm tree shall lie at every man's door. So what actually happened was the River Aus was a river next to York, and Aus Bridge was the bridge over that particular river. And at the time, this prophecy didn't mean anything to these people. It meant nothing. But... Later, the system brought water across Alice Bridge in pipes to a windmill that drew the water up into the pipes. Then the pipes they used were actually made out of elm trees. And those pipes came to every man's door, delivering water throughout the entire town. And the thing that you have to remember is that a lot of this stuff is in her future. So these are not actually things that she could explain by saying, you know, pipe will that will have a plumbing system when she doesn't know those things yet. So she's describing these prophecies and what's familiar to her. So she can see that an elm tree is laid down. She doesn't quite understand what it is, but she was correct. So the next one is before house bridge and Trinity church meet, what is built in the day shall fall in the night till the highest stone in the church be the lowest stone of the bridge. And not long after she gave this prophecy there was a huge storm that came through york and this storm knocked the steeple off of the church and part of the bridge was destroyed and it was swept away by the river but later when they were making repairs to the bridge some of the pieces from the previous steeple were actually used to make the foundation of the new section of this bridge which ultimately made the highest point the steeple the lowest point of the bridge. So she was correct about that. But this one is probably one of my favorites just because of the story that goes along with it. We're all familiar with Henry VIII, the Boleyn sisters and what happened there. So this was her prophecy. 
when the cow doth ride the bull then priest beware the skull and when the lower shrubs do fall the great trees quickly follow shall the mitred peacock's lofty cry shall to his master be a guide and one great court to pass shall bring what was never done by any king the poor shall grieve to see that day and who did feast must fast and pray fate so decreed their overthrow riches brought pride and pride brought woe so let's break this down okay let's break down this prophecy so let's start with when the cow doth ride the bull then priests beware the skull so a lot of the times mother shipton couldn't see faces or names but she could see their family heraldry so the cow actually represents the heraldry of henry the eighth and the bull represents anne boleyn let me let me just give you like a really quick overview of what the story with Henry VIII was in case you're not familiar. Henry VIII was married. Um, basically, he had an affair with a Boleyn sister who ultimately got pregnant, um, but she ended up leaving. And then he had another affair with the second Boleyn sister. Her name was Anne. Um, and Anne basically demanded that he divorce his current wife. And at this time in history, that was really frowned upon by the Catholic Church. He ended up breaking from the Catholic Church, which had never been done before. So there's a lot of story there. Um, but that's kind of like quickly what happened. Um, we'll see a few more things here as we're going through this prophecy. But that's kind of vaguely what happened. So the cow represents the heraldry of Henry VIII. The bull represents Anne Boleyn. And Mother Shipton is basically saying in her prophecy that she can see this marriage coming to be and once they are wed once they're married the priests need to be on the lookout because this is going to get nasty um this marks the beginning their marriage marks the beginning of the dissolution of monasteries and this is where henry the eighth demobilizes all monasteries friaries the convents it was a lot um, but she foresaw that so many priests, religious and secular, lost their lives for pressing against the law um, that basically ultimately limited the Catholic Church's power. So the next part is the mitered peacock's lofty cry shall to his master be a guide. In the late 15th century, early 16th century, Henry VIII was not the controlling force behind these policies and matters of state. As a matter of fact, the man who was the controlling figure was his chief advisor, Thomas Wolsey. And he was the son of a butcher and he kind of was brought up and became a chancellor and then a cardinal of the Catholic Church. He was also the king's chief advisor and he was a very controlling figure in the matters of the state and of Henry VIII's policies. Wolsey was even depicted as an like an, a second king, so to speak, because of how much influence he had. But in this prophecy, Mother Shipton is referring to him as a mitered peacock because he came from a really low state of being the son of a baker all the way up to being, you know, the, the side, you know, the second hand to the king, which is a huge leap. So the next part is, and one great court to pass shall bring what was never done by any king. And this is what I was talking about, how he took away the power from the Catholic Church so that he could ultimately divorce his current wife. This had never been done. No king before had ever broke from the Catholic Church. And upon this breaking, Henry VIII actually created the Church of England. So the next part, the poor shall grieve to see that day, and who did feast must fast and pray. Fate so decreed their overthrow, riches brought pride, and pride brought woe. So Henry VIII actually wanted to take control of all the land and property that the Catholic Church owned. Because he believed that the governing bodies, the heads of the monasteries, all of them were just corrupt. So he wanted to seize all of their resources and money and just stop any funding at all to their churches. So before this happened, the monks had actually become extremely wealthy with all the funding they had been getting. But once this was taken away, they became the poor. And 
anyone that they were helping with the funds they were receiving were suffering because they were, they had nothing to give them. So everyone was just absolutely grief stricken by what had happened. Everyone was suffering that, especially those that were in the lower class. And Mother Shipton ended up saying that the fall of the church was absolutely inevitable because the church had become so wealthy and they were so prideful that there was no way they were going to last. And ultimately, she believed that their pride was truly what caused all of this downfall. Of course, a lot of people blamed Henry VIII. I'm sure most people would, considering the fact that maybe you just don't have an affair Um, But she actually felt like had the church not been so prideful, had they just allowed him to, you know, separate from his wife, this downfall of the community would not have happened. So, I mean, there, there is some truth to what she said and maybe she is right about that. Um, But there, there were some other prophecies that she had that commented on the end of time and and things like that. We're not going to get into that. Um, And the reason is because some of them were written in a book that later was found out to be very fictional so far as which prophecies were actually hers and which ones the author himself actually created. Um, So for now, we're just going to stick with these few. There were other ones, um, especially smaller ones, that she gave to individual people regarding their own lives and what they could see coming. Um, But she, these were the biggest ones that they found out to actually be true. So Mother Shipton ended up living out the rest of her days in the cave that she was born in. She did not want to be um, buried in a formal grave. She very much just wanted to be left alone. Um, So there's not a lot known about what caused her death. Um, I believe she was actually in her mid-70s technically when she passed away. There's not a lot of information about her death. Um, That's just because she wanted to be left alone. She wanted to go naturally and uh, just be left where she was. So not a lot known about her death um, that obviously could be traced back to anything that would make it valid. We, We aren't really sure. But one thing to note about Mother Shipton is that anything that ever happened in her lifetime is given second, sometimes even third hand. We don't exactly know the validity of any of these things. It is very likely that there really was a woman named Mother Shipton. Um, It's very likely that she actually did live a lot of this life. We don't know for sure that she truly was deformed. Um, We don't know if, you know, she really had um, all the powers and magic that people discuss we don't we don't know that for sure but this has been carried down for many centuries um, through different families a lot of stories have been passed down so we do believe that she did exist Um, and it's likely that this is who she was but not a lot written about her so one interesting thing is that you can actually go and visit mother shipton's cave It's actually a gorgeous place. However, it does have paid admission, so you do have to pay to get in. Um, But you can see where she lived, and you can see one other really interesting thing about the place where she was born and raised. There is a pool that in the 16th century, 15th, 16th century, they believed looked like a skull. And this pool has the ability to turn things into stone. At least that's what they thought then. However, what's actually happening is the water that is spilling over into the pool has a lot of minerals and elements in it that are causing the items to be crystallized. And over time they get harder and harder. So they're, they're not wrong. (laughs) Technically it does turn things into stone and without the scientific knowledge that we have today, that would have seemed very plausible to them, but also very scary because that's not something that occurs naturally in their world. That's got to be supernatural. So that was just another thing that kind of pointed to the quote unquote evilness of what happened with Ursula's conception and um, just her life story there. They just believe there was some sort of supernatural thing going on. And that just kind of solidified that. But one thing about this is that you can go into the cave where she was born. They have a statue there that kind of depicts what they thought that she looked like. 
Um, the, the owners even have different events. They do Halloween things and things like that. There's always things going on there. So there's always something really fun to do and see. They give tours. It would be really interesting to go to for sure. But again, it's fairly controversial. People don't really, some people don't really agree that they should be charging for people to see it because it is a place that's just naturally occurring in the world and anyone has had access to it up until they started selling it as a tourist attraction. So that kind of has become an issue. But also, you can go into their gift shop there and they even sell things that have been petrified in the waters of the pool. So that would be a pretty cool thing to have, I think. But again, a really controversial place. So, but it's absolutely beautiful. You can even see the river where Agatha would have traveled up or down to get to the cave. Um, absolutely gorgeous. So let's go ahead and discuss the homework questions. So moving forward every week, I will give you a few questions at the end of our class. And you can just post these in our homework channel. And basically, I'm just trying to engage you with our lesson. This is just something for you to think about. There's no right or wrong answers. So number one, what are your thoughts on Mother Shipton's life story? Do you think that this is a likely telling of what happened in her life? Or do you think that it's been heavily embellished over the centuries? What do you think? Number two, there were a lot of rumors around Mother Shipton's marriage and death of her husband. What do you think actually happened? Do you think that she bewitched Toby into marrying him and then later killed him? Or do you think it was something else? Number three, do you think that it's justified for someone to charge money for people to see Mother Shipton's cave? On one hand, it's nice that there's someone to take care of it, make sure it's not vandalized. On the other hand, people have been able to get to this cave for free for centuries. So is it okay for someone to be making money off of this? What do you think? And number four, if you could put anything into the skull-shaped pool to turn it into stone, what would it be? Okay, you all, that's all that I've got for you for this first week of classes. So you can take your homework questions, uh, just post your answers in our homework chat or our homework channel, and I will talk to you in the next class. Bye.